Hello and welcome to the 905er podcast. I'm Roland Tano. I am Joel McLeod. This week we're looking at the third of our 905 region municipal races as we edge ever closer to election day on October the 24th. As we've mentioned before, we can't cover every race, uh, but we can highlight some of the races we think are the most interesting. Previously we saw the mayoral race in Hamilton had certainly come alive in recent weeks with three candidates who are the clear front runners. One of those three, Keenan Loomis, accepted our invitation for an interview and you can hear that in our back catalogue. Then we looked at the mayoral race in Milton. The last time Milton's mayoral race warranted serious attention was probably in the 1990s. But this year that appears to have changed. Zishan Hamid has been a town and regional councillor since 2010 and is a candidate with credentials that demand to be taken seriously. We invited Zishan to join us and would have invited Gore Krantz too if he'd had an email address we could send an invitation to. For this week's episode, we invited all three candidates running for Halton Regional Chair. For the first time since it became an elected position back in 2000, three candidates with credible political track records are running for the position, with clearly contrasting platforms. Or perhaps more accurately, a contrasting platform on one side and a lack of platform on at least one of the others. Incumbent Gary Carr and challenger Jay McKenna did not reply to our invitation. That is their right, and perhaps they think this podcast would not provide a fair forum for their platforms. Well, if Mr. Carr or Miss McKenna happen to listen to this episode, we will we'll reiterate one last time that any and every candidate for office who comes onto this podcast will be treated with the same courtesy and respect. Regardless of their party background or otherwise, they'd be given an opportunity they won't receive anywhere else to speak directly to voters at length and in detail. And we believe they owe it to the voters of Halton to show them the same respect by making themselves available to old and new media alike, for interviews and for local debates. They have no obligation to come on to this podcast, that's true. But they owe it to voters to be more than a name on a lawn sign, and to take opportunities to speak on the record and in detail. A candidate who doesn't want to speak all day and every day about their policy ideas, quite frankly, has no business being a candidate at all. Andrea Grobentz did reply and generously gave up time from her campaign and from her Thanksgiving Monday to speak to us. Andrea was previously the chair of Halton District School Board from 2018 to 2021, after first being elected in 2014. And in that capacity, she appears to have chaired a board of trustees that appeared publicly, at least, to be both collegial and effective, and made a number of well-crafted interventions with the province during the COVID-19 crisis in particular. In the past, she's also run her own business in the IT field and taught at the McMaster Centre for Continuing Education. Welcome, uh, Andrea Grabentz, to the 905 podcast. Uh, somewhat of a regular. This is your third time, I think, on the podcast. Um, this time as a candidate, previously as, as uh, chair of the Halton District School Board uh, trustees. Um, and, uh, well, I mean, you're, you're, you're an old hand at this podcast, that's for sure. But um, uh, in terms of running an election, I guess we should point out to guests that we, we've invited... Um, all three of the uh, candidates who are running for regional chair in Halton onto the podcast. Um, Andrea uh, was uh, good enough to to uh, reply and arrange a time with us, and uh, indeed on on Thanksgiving Monday, Monday no less. So uh, a candidate who's willing to make themselves available on a holiday. Um, uh, so Andrea, why don't you just kick off with with telling us a bit about you know why you decided to uh, to make this jump into you know from from one level of government to another. And uh, what do you believe you would you would bring to the role as uh, as Holton Regional Chair? Okay, so just a bit about uh, my background. Uh, I've been, as you said, with the Halton District School Board. I've been a trustee for eight years. Four of those years I spent as chair. I'm actually also a uh, entrepreneur. I started an uh, information technology business over 20 years ago, and I teach McMaster University. I have for over 20 years in their web design program. So I have actually a pretty broad, pretty broad experience. And, uh, you know, I, I think that politicians need to uh, assess 
where, you know, if they have done the work they intended to do. And I believe I've done that. I believe I've made good sustainable change at the Halton District School Board. And so it's uh, time to bring some fresh ideas onto the board, uh, perhaps bring some diversity to the board. Uh, there have been 11 white women sitting around that table for the last four years, you know, trying really hard. Um, but it is, uh, we don't have the lived experience that reflects the student population. So I think it's important to bring some fresh perspective to the table. So I was looking around at uh, other ways I could serve people. And uh, I came across the Halton chair position, the regional chair position. And I was looking at the responsibilities and I thought, wow, you know, the budget is actually the same size as ours, $850 million. And I went down the list and I'm like, as chair of the Halton district school board, I did that, 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 that. So it's really just moving from educational priorities to regional priorities. And I think there are some gaps there, definitely. And so, again, that was a, a good fit, a good move um, to look at the regional chair position because uh, the areas that I'm interested in uh, are actually at the regional level. Now, this is going to be a stupid question, <laughs> but um, there are a lot of listeners who are going to sit there and say, what does a regional chair do? <laughs> Uh, because quite frankly, it's not, it's a position that doesn't get a lot of, a lot of time in the limelight. Um, so you, uh, rather than you, just, you tell us what, how you, how you view the position and why, why you want to, to, to take the seat. Well, certainly the basic responsibilities, uh, include, um, working with, uh, improving the budget, uh, as well as, um, minding you know, setting the agenda for the meetings, uh, setting the strategic plan for the region in this case, uh, representing the region uh, within the region and outside of the region, uh, promoting economic development in the region or for the region, um, like those those sorts of, of things. Um, what I see the position right now uh, should also be including is more advocacy. I don't see that happening at the regional level as much as I believe it should. And uh, I have a very strong advocacy background. Uh, advocacy, advocacy, uh, so advocacy for, for what in particular? Or well, what? to push back against policies that are coming from other levels of government. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the amount of growth that we need to uh, make in Halton uh, through the A Place to Grow plan. Um, there were, I, I understand we're being mandated to do that, but the, tar the place that we are, t places we are targeted to grow uh, by the government uh, perhaps should have been pushed back earlier. Um, the whole issue in Burlington with the uh, transportation hub being basically the ticket agency down at, uh, in South Burlington in the downtown that should have been pushed back a lot earlier. And I think it, it also could have been pushed back by the chair. Uh, you know, it, uh, it went on for years and there are ramifications uh, because uh, that wasn't communicated well. I think the, one of the roles of um, office is to communicate the local context and the local operational um, impacts of decisions at other levels. And I've experienced that in the board um, where the provincial government makes this sweeping decision and I've pushed back as chair of the board uh, with my colleagues uh, right at my side to say, hey, you know, that does not make sense in the local context, what you're proposing. Like they proposed a, uh, when they were having problems with the Ontario Autism Program, uh, they had 4,000 kids on the wait list and were getting a lot of, of uh, upset people. They decided to throw those, those kids into the education system with 60 days notice, with no plan, nothing. And uh, many of those children were in very intense therapies that uh, had them outside of the education system for most of their time, if not all of their time. So we had a thousand kids that were just going to be thrown into our system without any proper supports or plan. So 
as politicians, we stood up and said, no, the first thing you do is you write your letter and then you make it more public. You, I, if you Google my name, you'll see uh, that I had interview after interview after interview, um, mm -hmm. trying to get that information pushed back to the government to say, you know, that doesn't make sense locally. You're, that's not good for the students that have autism and it's, it's going to cause chaos in our schools. And and they stopped. They said, "Okay, uh, we hear you." And uh, and I think that's the job of the politician. So I'd like to do that at the regional level for issues that come up. One just want to follow follow up on just one, one last point on that. On that. Like one of the, one of the things that we we keep coming back to on this podcast is the issue of development and housing. That it's not just a Halton region; it's the entire 905. You know, we we're the the province talking about wanting to develop you know 1.5 to 2 million new homes. Um, for people to live in, we we are definitely the, re the Halton region is definitely a target for that for that development. But that's all well and good. But the the, de the devil's always in the details. And mm -hmm. you have four re region uh, four municipalities of various sizes: Milton, Halton Hills, Burlington, and Oakville. We're not quite sure how those councils are going to be uh, at post uh, post the election. But this is a very contentious argument. It's a it's a lightning rod for personalities all over the place and and, and whatnot. I'm wondering how how are you going to approach kind of building that consensus because it, it's it sounds to me you you leave yourself open to a, to being undermined by potential city councilors town councilors mayors even depending on who gets elected um, to kind of to be able to push back if you're if you're if you're possibly a lone voice at the table how, how are you planning to build that consensus? Uh, I'm uh, I'm known to be a good collaborator. Um, the uh, I. I've been listening already um, while I've been going around and talking to the different, um, I've been talking to current sitting uh, councillors, I've been talking to current sitting mayors, I've been talking to prospective mayors and councillors, uh, and so I'm feeling the, um, uh, where people are, are in the North is feeling really disenfranchised right now, I have to say, and um, they're pretty open about it. Um, I think that we need to come up with a, a better way to have conversations about growth. Um, basically, uh, they feel that the two uh, larger municipalities at this time are kind of railroading their their plan over um the uh, the northern because they're smaller on council and i think we need to find a way to you know sit down and really understand each other understand where you know where those uh feelings are coming from um because it, you know it is all based on relationships uh you really have to dig in and you really have to understand people's people's perspectives and uh if that's not there then people just hold on with all their might to what they think think is happening when it's not the reality. So I think we need to do some, you know, team building um, and some really, you know, sitting down and, and understanding what the needs are in the North and the South and uh, try to, to figure out, um, you know, where that middle ground lies and work with it. And part of that will come out when we're working on our regional strategic plan because you all have to come together to build that and it has to be approved at the table. So it's a, it's actually an excellent place to kind of work out those issues and to understand those issues um, from the different perspectives. So, uh, I mean, I was thinking one of, one of perhaps the biggest thing that, that there's been uh, on the kind of regional agenda since, since we've been doing this podcast has been the vote a few months back um, where the the region and uh, well, I mean the region regional councillors voted fairly overwhelmingly. I'm not quite sure what the division the divide on the votes was eventually against um, the idea of boundary expansion. Um, and there was a vote against it both in Milton, with their specifically because they have most of the green space in in the region. This kind of in their patch, mm -hmm. um, uh, 
and and we know that this is this is something that the province is not necessarily going to be keen on. In fact, I mean, they they haven't said much about Halton as far as I'm aware so far, but they've been very outspoken when it comes to Hamilton. That Hamilton's similar vote against boundary expansion to sort of increase the land available to developers was was met with. Uh, well, we're waiting to see what happens, but um, it seems to me like there's a very good chance that the province will simply overrule that and say, okay, you can vote how you like, but we're going to decide what actually happens. Now, what would you do in that kind of circumstance? I mean, it seems to me that there are there's more and more of a case that the municipalities and the regional municipalities need to kind of work better together mm-hmm. um, uh, to kind of use their, their collective power to to put pressure on the province because if they if they if they continue in the, you know the, the traditional thing of that they everybody tries to get on with the province because the province has the money to dish out um but if they carry on that way then the province is always going to win when it comes down to these kind of contentious issues so do you think there's anything you can do in that regard to kind of uh, beef up the role of the region so to speak in, in kind of um f- fighting fighting uh, fighting the municipal corner if you like against the provincial uh, preferences Mm-hmm. I so I come at things uh, with a very I'm a programmer by trade so I come at things in a very logical way very reasoned way uh, I'm not a intimidating person I we've never met in person or anything but I'm a whole not even quite five foot two um, so I uh, I use other means to get my point across and I've been very successful to do that um, in doing that. So um, as an example, the uh, when I used to sit around a conference call with 72 board chairs and the Minister of Education he used to call me by my first name and it wasn't because we were buddies. Uh, it's because I am a darn squeaky wheel and uh, I was very successful at getting him to understand and make change based on the, the things I was asking and saying and explaining. And uh, I, I just hope to do that at the at the regional level, too, um, for, you know, the issues that you mentioned. Now, uh, and and I guess the the million dollar question or is, is can a challenger to an incumbent at the regional level actually get any traction i mean we we have you know in gary carr i'm not sure that gary carr has ever really run a campaign since he was first elected regional chair um he hasn't had strong opponents this is and and i'm not including you that you in that statement Mm -hmm. um this is the first regional chair election where three quality candidates the incumbent uh you and and jane mckenna the former pcmp mpp sorry uh, are running you know this is definitely different from from previous elections but um i'm getting the impression that that um gary carr is not um he's not exactly running his his side of things any different from from previously i mean last week there were there were a couple of opportunities for for candidates for the regional chair candidates to actually debate in public mm-hmm. he didn't attend either nor did jane mckenna yeah, there uh, were you, three opportunities, one three, in rural Milton and two in uh, Oakville that were organized by residents associations. And uh, we had lots of notice, especially for the third debate. I got my invitation July the 5th. I mean, is it just simply a matter of he's like, I don't care, I'm going to win anyway? I mean, because that's how it's all worked in the past or or, or what do you, you know? I, I have no idea. He sent regrets to all three and Jane McKenna, Jane McKenna didn't respond to two of them, two invitations at all, and then declined the third. And what, I mean, you know, obviously, I, you know, we we can like I said at the start, we can only talk to the candidates who will talk to us, and uh, I don't see why I shouldn't ask you a question which is kind of teeing it up for you. But what do you think that says about their campaigns? <laughs> well, if they're not going to show up to ask you for their vote, are they going to show up when you need them? Because I'm going to show up. I'm going to show up. I'm going to show up again and again and again. I'm going to stand up for people. Uh, I love interfacing with people. And uh, I'm not, I'm not afraid of people. I'm not afraid of questions. Uh, I think that um, it's really unfortunate and disrespectful to the voter and to those residents associations. I mean, uh, the one on Thursday night was uh, several residents associations in East Oakville that got together to do that. And uh, the one um, 
Oh, sorry. That was the, uh, that was the one on Tuesday. Uh, the one on Thursday was the Brawny Village Residents Association. And it is, a, again, a long standing. They do this. The Oakville ones go way back. And I understand that uh, um, Gary Carr did not show up to the last um, version <laughs> in uh, 2018 either. And uh, yeah, left the single candidate. Um, there well, so well, it, i i don't know this and I, I don't know if it goes back even <clears throat> further th than that um but uh, it's to me it's disrespectful it's people need the information people are starving for information to make an mm -hmm. informed choice and when mm -hmm. you don't show up it's like you're denying them that information and uh, you know people are yeah. jane mckenna says hey i want accountability <laughs> but she doesn't show up how do you be well, accountable? Let's let's <laughs> let's play double let's play devil's advocate here. Um, you know, Roland Roll and I have have criticized debates in the past because they are are they're they're, clum they're clumsy mechanisms. Usually, they're it's an overcrowded table, and you know you you can only speak about complex issues in you know a thirty second soundbite. So what you know uh, you know do, do are, are debates necessary? Do you think, or or is this just a, a passe uh, a thing of the uh, of the past that that you know, has served as, served as function, but in the, in this modern age of social media and, and, and podcasting, shameless plug, uh, you know, oh, debates aren't necessary. Why, why, why should they show up? Well, I, I think debates allow people to uh, talk about their platform, what they're going to do. And I know I've been very upfront on my website as well about my platform, but my two competitors do not have any information about a platform on either of the websites. So there is no, and I've seen their written material. It also does not have any kind of platform. So how are people to make an informed choice uh, if that's not there? And the, uh, the debates themselves, it's not just about the debate. It's the before the debate, the after debate. People get access to you to be able to ask questions face to face. Um, that's also really important um and uh I, yeah i i'm all for debates um i was happy that those associations moved forward with allowing me to to talk even when um, my competitors my opponents weren't there uh at the milton one i got to answer every question uh asked of the candidates uh it was the councillors the mayors two mayoral mayoral candidates and myself and um and then at the one on tuesday i got to give a five minute um talk and then answer questions directly from the audience and then the one on thursday they were questions collected uh prior to the uh debate um, so I got a two minute intro, three questions, two minute closing, but I got to talk to a lot of people there and they got to talk to me. So, um, yeah, I, it's, it's when you're trying to cover a thousand square kilometers, like you are in what the race that I'm running, those opportunities are golden for people mm -hmm. because I'm not going to get to everybody's house. I just 193,000 households. I can't do it. So this is an opportunity to have groups together it's, to ask questions. So I think they're more important in larger races like like mine than even in smaller races. Perhaps. It's, so I, that's that's a striking. You said 193,000 households, households doors that, doors that are eligible. Uh, I don't know if they're all eligible, but it's still a huge number. Well, yeah. It, well, <laughs> presumably there's at least one person in each household that is eligible to. Uh, to vote um that's a that's a huge that is a huge constituency mm -hmm, to be account is. accountable to and I, you know it, that that is down to me. i i, I kind of i you mentioned uh, uh bring your policy and i do want to bring back to one of the one of your policy platforms that really caught rolling in myself's eye mm -hmm. um and i want to just explain to to uh our listeners you you've proposed a regional transit system yes. what exactly is because i'll be honest i was excited because for the first time in my lifetime, uh, a regional chair is actually proposing to do something instead of just being a regional chair. So tell us, tell us about that plan. How would it work? What would it, what, what would it do? Go. Okay. Well, right now we have, uh, just to remind the listeners, we have three municipal transit systems right now. We have Burlington, Milton, and Oakville, and Halton Hills doesn't have one. And uh, so if I'm living in Burlington and I work in Milton to take public transit, I actually have to grab a GO bus 
and go to Winston Churchill, grab another go bus and go to Milton. So that's insane. <laughs> no one's going to do that. And so they don't do that. And when I'm walking around talking to people, uh, they're moving into the region from places like Toronto, et cetera, that are a transit first they have a transit first attitude. They are expecting to get on transit. They get here and they're very disappointed to find out that, yeah, you need a car. You need a car in Halton to get anywhere because it is so car centric. And so it's so frustrating to see people who want transit, who, who really want transit to be denied transit. And then when you get up to Halton Hills, they don't have anything. And uh, they would actually, uh, you know, they want to be able to get down to uh, appointments, uh, hospital, you know, and, and that's not available unless you have a car. Or if they, a lot of them, I mean, Georgetown's pretty close to um, Peel region, and often they get jobs there. Well, you have to drive. And I'm hearing from parents that are saying it's really hard being, you know, raising a teenager and uh, not having a transit option available. I mean, I know that I have three teenagers. I throw them on the local bus just because they want to go to the mall. But um, if they wanted to go to the mall in Milton, they can't do it. <laughs> it it's such, well, there's t two things come to mind just from my own experience coming out of that. I mean, one is that uh, four years ago when, when I ran, I know from conversations with uh, then challenger now mayor Marion mead ward that regional transit was very much on her agenda and you know i'm going to totally give her a pass on the fact that covid happened and maybe the regional transit couldn't get to the top of the list and i don't know whatever conversations she's had in the meantime um uh and, and it's something that made obvious sense to me as well it's it's, it's crazy we have elderly people on you know accessibility disabled people buses who get taken to the edge of Burlington have to get off a bus with all their walkers and their canes, uh, stand on the sidewalk for a couple of minutes, waiting for another bus to come, and then clamber onto that because the buses can't cross the city boundaries. Um, I mean, it's an uh, it's ridiculous <laughs> beyond belief, uh, in my opinion, uh, and. Certainly, this is a discussion that is worth having, which, again... And we wouldn't be the first region to do it. We're not inventing anything new what, here. What, what, other re what other regions have, have, Waterloo, have done Waterloo, York. Okay. You know, like, and Waterloo is a great example because it is a similar kind of region to mm. us. So if they can do it, we can do it. And let's see how they actually fund it, because that's always the big scream, right? Well, it's, you know, well, let's see what they did. I'm, I'm not for change for the sake of change, but boy, let's look at some of these well, strategic items and well, if you see think it'll work. I'll be honest, <laughs> you think it, there it, are it, economies it, of scale. There must be economies of scale that, that we have have three municipalities all with their own transit system their own transit bureaucracy their own you know it, it seems like a very you know if you're going no, to talk about sort of uh, traditionally conservative principles a very tr conservative uh, approach to, yeah. to merge and simplify yeah <laughs> well, let's like, efficient that, that, effective attractive that's what it needs mm. to be so mm -hmm. like, just to, I, don't, I want to clarify what this would mean are you talking about a transit system between the four municipalities in Halton, are you talking about taking over the transit in Milton, Burlington, Oakville, and instead of like a Burlington and Oakville transit or Milton transit, it would just be like Halton transit and that you would expect the Halton, Halton region to develop new routes, uh, be the, the source of payment for to bus drivers, sign the contracts, make the purchases. Are we talking like an actual regional transportation system or just a, a like a, a rapid bus system, just a shuttle bus to get us from one city to another? Just what I, I don't. I think list, our listeners want to clarify what exactly this would mean. I, I think it needs a revamp. Um, you know, really, uh, really take it to the regional level. Have it fully coordinated by the the region, not just a, a bus from Milton to Burlington, a bus from Milton to the Halton Hills. Like, mm -hmm. I, yeah. I think that it really needs. Like, let's let's take Dundas as you know, right across. Let's. Uh, uh, Bronte Road, right up Trafalgar, you know, like mm -hmm. whatever it takes and make those, you know, we have to, we're, we have to grow up as a region. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that will help us get there to realize, you know, people, 
don't live and work in and play in Burlington, you know, or Oakville or Milton. People need to get around further. And, and this would also include, of course, talking to our adjacent uh, regions so that there is seamless trans transit there as well. Guelph, Peel, Hamilton, you know, let's, Let's make this work. We don't need to all come down to basically the go to be able to move and then come up again. You know, let's move across the system. I would love to see the province do this on a very large scale, but I don't see that happening. So let's do well, it in the regional level. Okay. On that note, because mm -hmm. um, this is something I know a little bit about. Um, you're you're gonna bump, you're gonna bump heads with the province. Um, I, I know for a fact, like the the laws, they're 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 heavily entrenched because we're talking about getting onto to bus routes between mm -hmm. municipalities and i know that there's that's a very regulated industry you're going to be go, you're going to go up against in some cases some coach services mm -hmm. um yeah. but they i mean as i right. said they've done it in waterloo they've done it in other places how did they do it let's figure it out so let's just um have it, yeah, let's move to another subject that, that there's obviously i mean at every level of government right now is, is a constant refrain um uh, but which actually, um, to a considerable extent, falls to the regional government to to handle, and that is well, affordable housing and subsidised housing. Subsidised housing is a regional responsibility, mm -hmm. not a municipal one, not yep. not a lower level municipality one. Um, and I got some things to say about our subsidised housing. Okay, so Apparently. go uh, ahead. Go. What what are your thoughts? <laughs> okay. yeah. Well, no, I I mean part of it is as I've been walking around, I've met people living in our subsidised housing and. Uh, and they were single moms and they came to me and said, oh, you're a candidate. Maybe you can help us. Well, that sends signals to me right then and there. There is a communication issue happening at region. But they were dealing with bed bugs. They were dealing with mold. They were dealing with rats. This is our money. We're subsidizing these women to stay with their kids in this housing it's supposed to only be temporary to help people through, you know, crisis situations, uh, not supposed to be, you know, forever. So we need, we need to make sure that the conditions are actually not a hindrance to them being able to uh, get back to independent living. And right now, what I heard uh, from these women, they're, they're afraid that their children are going to be taken away from them. And they're dealing with a landlord that uh, we're paying the landlord is uh, threatening to evict them if they complain. Well, <laughs> we need some basic standards there. And we also need uh, the people that are using our social housing to have a good communication channel uh, so that there's not this, uh, you know, threatening overhang. Uh, they should be able to live without that worry. <laughs> we sh nobody should have to worry about, you know, rats and mold and and bed bugs um, we, should we be looking instead of it you you, you kind of hit you kind of touch upon i think part of what the problem is in your in your answer is that it's been viewed as a temporary solution mm -hmm. and i think something that we've i mean roll and i have talked about this you know since day one i think on this podcast is and everybody else is coming to this realization we are not building housing fast enough to to yeah. meet up with demand um, mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons why housing prices are constantly skyrocketing, uh, same as rent is skyrocketing for many people, regardless of your social economic status uh, across the 905. Rather than this be socialized housing being a stepping stone into better things, mm -hmm. should we be looking at uh, at making it uh, just permanent housing? If you if you are you know whether the mo whatever economic model that might look, but make Halton. Uh, the Halton, sorry, the region of Halton, a landlord, for better, lack of a better, better phrase, uh, in all four municipalities of Halton region, is is should we just be making this into a permanent? Like, if you're in, you can live there until the day you die or the day you move out, whichever comes first. Well, I, I think we need to take a good look at places where uh, there's been some success doing that, and. As I said, I'm not, let's not reinvent the wheel. It's happening well somewhere. Let's find that and bring it here. I mean, also, I'm going to repeat a phrase that I've said, said multiple times. <laughs> uh, and that is that the, um, the market doesn't build affordable housing. The market mm -hmm. builds slums. Um, and if you want quality, affordable housing, affordable, I mean, and I'm distinguishing here affordable as in however you define affordable, but approximately uh, 
housing that's affordable by the average person, not necessarily a wealthy person, and subsidised housing, which is people who need some help to to get their their uh, rent paid. Um, so it's two distinct sectors, albeit somewhat related. Um, yeah, just just sort of to to, to add a, a, another level to what to what Joel was saying. I mean, do you, do you, do you think you know the the, the scope for um, either the region or the lower level municipalities or both to really kind of look at look at the uh, at the possibility of you know investing in housing serious amounts of housing itself you pay to get the stuff built uh, you make sure that it's it's of a reasonable quality or of a good quality uh, and yeah this isn't transitional housing this is housing the region or the city as the landlord um, what do you think I think we need to look at it uh, let's look at it Let's see what uh, what we you know what our what our tolerance is for um, being able to afford that as well as afford other things that people want um, because it all comes down to tax dollars, right? Uh, and we have to be able to um, afford all the things. Um, and it's I think it's really important to have affordable housing. I don't think that it's something that the region is going to solve on its own. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, it's going to take all levels of government sitting down and we need to do this. Uh, just my own house has tripled in 16 years in its value. Uh, whereas, you know, wages have not <laughs> hardly moved really. Uh, and so how does that that, that doesn't work. I have three kids. They're going to end up living in my basement if we don't do something about it until they're like in their 40s. So let's uh, let's get to it. Um, many people are motivated. It's one of the number one issues um, that I come across. Uh, I'm often talking to parents who have kids in their 20s living in their basement, or I'm talking to kids in their 20s living in their parents' basements. Um, it's, uh, it's really... It's really, uh, it's a reality right now, and uh, it's only going to get worse if we don't do something about it. Now, I don't have all the answers. Um, what you're suggesting sounds great, but let's look at it. Let's really take a good analysis of it, take it back, see if there's, if that'll work or something else works. Um, I'm, uh, as, I, as I've mentioned before, I'm an IT consultant. Uh, so it's not my wheelhouse to know exactly what the answer is, but as chair of the region, I have the ability to say, yeah, let's, let's look at this. Let's study this, go and write a report on this, uh, you know, really dig in because this needs, this needs a, a solution. Um, and, uh, I mean, balancing against all sorts of other, um, things that are going on, people are afraid that, um, you know, there'll be, um, multiple people living in in houses well that's already happening <laughs> it just is happening in a in a in a more of a family situation um because i, I suppose can't the, afford to live outside the, the of one pushback that i can i'll be honest i can see you receiving uh should you be elected and you push forward on on revamping this is basically the zoning the, the zoning bylaws mm -hmm. um a lot of people I know for a fact that you know where, where I live when I when I bought my house uh, uh, years a decade ago. Um, you know, there's a co-op. There's a co-op in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Lovely people. They're it's, it's they're good. They're, they are good homes for people. But I was told, you know, you're living next to poor people. And when I bought the house, and we're like, I don't care. I like the house. I like the neighborhood. I'm buying it. I have mm -hmm. haven't looked back since. I tell that anecdote because that attitude exists in a lot of regions in in Halton. Uh, Halton's yes. a very wealthy uh, 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 region, and a lot of people who say, "Well, I don't want poor people. I don't want ghettos next door to my. I don't want to. I don't. I don't want a neighborhood of poor people living next door to me." And I'm wondering, policy is great, but like, how, how do we combat that? Because I, that's something that comes back to a lot of you know a lot of the pushback on affordable housing. It's, yeah, yeah, we need affordable housing. We need socialized housing. That's great. That's great. That's great. Hey, can I build it next to you? No. No, not next to me. Yeah, there's a lot of NIMBYism out there. And I, and um, I like, how, <laughs> but how, how, how are you, how are you going again? How are you going to go ahead and build that consensus and build that movement to say, you know, that vacant lot, maybe we can fit two or three affordable housing units on that, on that vacant lot there or revamp or redesign uh, an existing building to fit four or five or six affordable units on there for, uh, for people to live in. Yeah, I, and I know, and I, we need people of all income stripes living in Halton to do all the things that uh, 
need to be done in Halton. So it's something that came to mind when you were talking and we're not talking low income here, but so my mother is uh, uh, my best campaigner, of course. And so she goes to the dentist and she, when she's there, she's uh, talking to all the office staff and the hygienist and the, the dentist, you know, my daughter's running for, for uh, regional chair. Do you live in Halton? 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 The only person that lived in Halton was the dentist. That's going to be a major issue. As the places where these people are coming from build up, they're going to make choices. Do I want to commute into Halton or not? And many of them will choose a good quality of life of not having a long commute into Halton. It's the gridlock and the QEW and all the things that come with it. And um, the other thing that we're going to end up killing off are those sort of family owned uh, small businesses because they rely on local employees. You know, the large big box stores, they can afford to ship in people on buses. doesn't bother them at all. They can just build it into their costs, but entrepreneurs can't do that. They rely on people around them to work in their shops. So if you starve them of employees because they can't afford to live at that wage, then we don't end up with local shops. So it like it's a domino effect that goes on and on. So we really we really should be more motivated to get this this done and to have a better attitude about um, more mixed kinds of of living arrangements. Um, as a trustee and as uh, as a parent, even with um, more mixed uh, living, um, like of different income levels, that's better for kids because they had a better understanding of life. If everybody's all at that, you know, middle or high income level, then there there's really a, a missing perspective there as they move forward. Um, we really need we need everybody to understand everybody to have a good good empathy for everybody um well, so, I, 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 uh, yeah. again with with the, with, the, with the whole transit system uh, debate i think you know if, if we well you know if we're taking the environmental you know if we're talking about climate emergency and i think most of the municipalities i'm not sure if the region does but most municipalities have a climate emergency on mm-hmm. yeah it's, it's on the books it's, it's part of their their order of business so to speak um then we've really got to be talking about how to get yeah every we can't have people driving from less uh less wealthy um regions to work in our region it's going to mm-hmm. stop happening but uh, to, to to wrap up here we're, we're getting to the end of our time and i i, I want to do i mean the Gary Carr and Jane McKenna um, didn't want to appear on on this podcast, but I think it's only fair that we, we tr- I'm going to do my best to kind of put their arguments and then allow you to to answer those. So um, uh, I'm going to start off with Gary Carr. So I mean, I, and I've we've been watched, I've certainly been watching Gary Carr long enough to kind of uh, know his his traditional um, the points that he will go for, and and I think he would point out that you know Halton is one of the wealthiest um, regions in in the country. Ninety eight percent of residents rate quality of life very high. Um, one of the safest places in in the country. Thirteen years as the safest municipality, and the credit rating. I, I know um, Gary Carr would always mention that you know uh, financially the the region is on sound footing. It's is rated triple A by 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 the people who rate these kind of things, I think Moody's and Standard and Bohr or, you know, these guys, um, you know, he's a safe pair of hands. And my goodness, he has a lot of experience going back decades to being speaker in, in the uh, legislature in uh, at Queen's Park. Um, you know, how do you answer that? Because I mean, clearly you, you can't compete on, on experience with, with someone like that. How, how do you uh, how do you make the case that it's, it's time for a change? So Gary's been there 16 years and I know you're reading right from his website because <laughs> yeah. uh, I've read it charged. over <laughs> <laughs> and it's the only information he has out there. He hasn't got a platform about what the, his vision is moving forward at all. His uh, tagline is keep Halton the best, which for me feels very stagnant. It's like, a, you know, we're the best. Well, are we the best? Are we the best? What are we the best at? And how do you propose to keep that happening? You're just saying keep halt in the best. So we can't just stop and let the whole world go past. So that's what it feels like with uh, Gary's statement um, and Gary's 
website. <laughs> um, it, it, it's not, um, it's not innovative. Uh, his, his vision is well. And also when you're talking about the problems that I mentioned about social housing, there are cracks, there are gaps. We're not catching everything we need to. So how can we claim that we're the best and to keep it the best? Um, when you're, when you're staying below inflation, that means you're actually probably starving the system in some places. Uh, it's <clears throat> like, I think that things need to be resourced properly and we need to look at, to see that that is, you know, that we are doing that. Um, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read from, from Jane McKenna's uh, website now and, and, and uh, the reasons that she, she gives why we should vote for her. There's a silence because there is nothing on her website saying why we should vote for her. It says that she was an experienced leader and she was MPP for Burlington and that's all quite correct and she gives some more detail. I mean, I'm trying to be completely fair here and, and uh, you know, I started off slightly sarcastic and I do want to give her a fair um, reading, so to speak, but I have to say there is nothing other than her experience as an MPP on the website that, that says why she should be a candidate. If, if, if the McKenna campaign wants to contact me and say there's all these things that I'm missing out, I would love to hear from them and I would love to hear what it is, but I can only go on what, I, what I've got here and that's what I'm reading. Um, but I, I suspect that Jane McKenna would say, um, if she was on uh, here now, that, you know, yeah, she has does have all that experience at Queen's Park. And the other thing is that she has that you wouldn't have is um, you know, a working relationship, perhaps, with the, with the provincial government, because she's, she was a member of the provincial government. Um, you threw your hat into the ring to run for the Liberals at the mm -hmm. last election. Um, you know, some, one of the things being leveled at Andrea Horvath in uh, Hamilton right now is like, how do you work? How on earth do you think you're going to work with the province when you know you've been throwing bricks at the uh, at the uh, at the premier for the last figurative however many bricks, years? Not real bricks. Uh, <laughs> figurative bricks, yes, yes, metaphorical bricks. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, how? Uh, I think that that's the best I can I can come forward with as her kind of argument. Like, well, look, I'm 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 someone who they will look upon with 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 kindness. Um, uh, uh, so vote for me. So I mean, uh, what would your Aren't answer you to that be? Aren't you a little afraid that having uh, a really recent MPP in the provincial government sitting at the regional chair position is uh, risky that you won't be heard? That it'll be the message will actually be coming down from the province as opposed to pushing back on the province. Uh, I've well known to work, I've worked with Jane McKenna before. She actually, uh, if you look on my website, she uh, she actually said, uh, I think it's, an, I'm an incredible woman uh, and uh, mentioned me on uh, International Women's Day along with uh, a lot of um, other women that are, are strong women working in Burlington. So I've worked with her before. Uh, right now I have people of all, and I really mean all political stripes, uh, working to help get me elected. I work well in a very big sandbox. Um, the point is always to reach the goal, help the people, not help only these people or only those people. It's to help everybody move forward. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not worried about that. Um, as I've mentioned before, I've gotten things done uh, with the provincial government. Um, when I was chair and it's because when you, when you're looking for it's, this is not about me. This position is not about me. It's about moving the region and moving the people of Halton forward. So that's what I want to carry on my back. I don't, I'm not looking for anything for myself. You know what? I think we'll leave it at that for now because we're, uh, I see we're coming up on our, on our time limit. So thank you very much, Andrea, for, uh, for taking the time from your campaign. Uh, and especially on Thanksgiving, uh, day to, to, to talk with us. We very much appreciate it and, uh, all the best and good luck to you on your, on your campaign. I really appreciate you asking me out. <laughs> That's it for this episode of the 905er. Thank you for listening. As always, you can send us your feedback, thoughts, and concerns or ideas for future episodes to our email, 
info at 905er.ca. We'd love to hear from you. You can help us keep the 905er going by financially supporting us through Patreon as well as PayPal. Visit us at 905er.ca and click on the support tab. As well, links are in the show notes for your convenience. Lastly, you can find us on social media. Search for the underscore 905er on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So long for now. See you next time. Looking to make the most out of this life and optimize your personal wellness? Then check out the Natural Man Podcast. Join me, host Mike C, as we explore all areas of human wellness, physical, mental, and emotional. Learn strategies to optimize your own well-being and be in the driver's seat of your own health. Remember, your doctor works for you. Learn biohacks, neurohacks, ways to improve sleep, and ways to optimize your body and your mind. Check us out on Apple, Spotify, the Fountain app, and at naturalmanpodcast.com.